So thanks everyone for joining uh, our webinar on nutrition and hydration for young athletes. Uh, just a bit of housekeeping. Um, please put any questions that you have uh, for Dr. Balaji in the chat and he will answer them after his presentation. Um, so I'd like to introduce Dr. Arvind Balaji. He's a pediatric sports medicine specialist and he sees patients at Stanford Medicine and Children's Health location in Pleasant Hill. But I will mention that we have five other Bay Area locations for those of you who are joining from other areas. Uh, so back to Dr. Balaji, uh, he specializes in the treatment and prevention of sports injuries. And he also treats fractures and sprains and other injuries that are just a result of kids being kids. Um, he has a special interest in concussion and we'll be sharing some tips on diagnosing concussions and managing recovery in the next few weeks. Um, Dr. Balaji received his medical degree from the Medical College of Georgia. He did his residency at Phoenix Children's Hospital and his fellowship at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. He's board certified in pediatrics and sports medicine. So without further ado, here's Dr. Balaji. Thank you, Amy, for that uh, wonderful introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my slides here with everybody. And just wanted to make sure that, uh, does that look visible on everybody's side? Perfect, all right. So I'll go ahead and bring up, there we are. All right, so thanks everybody for joining us on this afternoon. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you guys on this topic. Um, I hope that everybody can have um, something that they gain out of this conversation. And um, I will try to go through in a relatively brief manner and highlight the most important points about what I think um, children, parents, and coaches should know about nutrition and, and fluids and hydration in kids that are athletes. Um, and I'll try to save a little extra time at the end for questions. That's usually the most interesting and um, um, important part for a lot of people. So I try to uh, do what I can to make sure that everybody has uh, the opportunity to ask a question and we have the chance to discuss it. Um, so our objectives will be to talk about the challenges regarding pro providing nutrition for pediatric patients. Um, we'll talk about the demands that pediatric patients who are athletes have on their body for, uh, from a micronutrient and macronutrient standpoint and how we can go about addressing them. Um, we'll talk specifically about the nutritional and fluid demands, and then we'll also give a little bit of an evidence-based approach to supplements. I usually spend the least amount of time on supplements as I'll go through in the, uh, towards the latter end um, of these slides. Um, particularly because I have some strong feelings about the appropriate foundation for nutrition and uh, the appropriate foundation for fluids and hydration. Um, and supplements really are um, quite a step below those important uh, parameters first. And, and we'll go into more detail about that towards the end. I don't have any financial conflicts of interest to disclose. Every once in a while, you may hear me uh, mention a brand name, but that's purely coincidental or purely for the sake of communication. Um, and as Amy pointed out, I've lived kind of all over the country. I was raised in Colorado. I went to college in St. Louis. I did medical school in Georgia, residency in Arizona, and fellowship in Philadelphia. So I um, have ties sort of all over the country, and now I'm, I'm privileged to call the Bay Area my home. So as we just sort of lay the foundation for what we want to talk about today, pediatric patients provide a lot of challenges to us in terms of meeting their energy demands. So we have to consider a lot of things from a nutritional standpoint. In general, because of the nature of their growth and development, they have greater needs of protein per kilogram of body weight compared to their adult counterparts, which is just reserved for the fact that they're undergoing a very metabolically heavy growth process. And in that same vein, they need more calcium to support their bones compared to older people. Um, every single time they take a step or jump or hop, they have significantly higher cost on their metabolic system compared to everybody else. Um, they also have a relatively increased use of fat during their um, phases of exercise. They also have a different sweat, sweat quality, which makes a big difference in terms of providing appropriate um, uh, fluids and, and replenishment of lost fluids during exercise and after sport. And for them, they feel the deficits of dehydration significantly more than adults do. So we've got quite a challenge ahead of us. Um, so we know that children already need to be closely monitored just by their regular doctor for appropriate nutrition and appropriate hydration just for regular development. <clears throat> then we add on the layer that they become athletes and some of them incredibly high level athletes. And that adds an, a, a much more complex layer on top of what we already are dealing with. And we have to be careful of the risks of not, not meeting these, this challenge appropriately. Most children who are not appropriately nourished will complain of, a, of relatively common symptoms. They won't be able to focus as well. And that's true for both the academic realm as well as when they're in sport. 
They may complain of frequent headaches. They will definitely feel tired, definitely have trouble waking up in the morning, and even maybe have trouble going to sleep at night. Their sports performance will, will definitely take a hit, and they will be at increased risk of injury uh, due to chronic nourishment issues. Um, and so there's, there's some obvious uh, serious consequences of, of not meeting this demand that we need to be aware of as we're, as we're figuring out how best, how best to provide nutrition and how best to provide hydration. Um, particularly for young female athletes, uh, there are some well-described issues that they can run into if we're not doing a good job of making sure they have enough calories and en enough nourishment and nutrition to meet their metabolically active bodies demand. Particularly, we know that if we do a bad job of this, um, they can have some deficits of bone mineral density where they can start to develop thinner bones. Um, and some of that, if we let it go too far, can be irreversible. They can have some chronic uh, poor mineral density of their bones. Additionally, they may have issues related to puberty, either going through puberty too early or, or more likely having a delayed pubertal cycle and then associated menstrual dysregulation once their period starts. Um, and all of these things can be quite distressing and quite dangerous to patients. And so this is something we have to, again, keep in the backdrop as we're talking about um, how we're gonna go about managing the demand. So our solution for all of this is relatively straightforward. And I hope that the take home message is that this, this challenge can be met in a straightforward way that doesn't require too much um, of, of a complicated medical jargon approach. We'll talk about the solution from these five categories. We have to meet the caloric demand of athletes. And underneath the caloric demand, we have to provide appropriate nourishment from a, a fat standpoint, a carbohydrate standpoint, and a protein standpoint. And then lastly, of course, very important, we also have to talk about how are we gonna hydrate our athletes. So with that to start, I really like this slide and I really like this um, chart because it really puts into perspective the caloric demand by age. And I put an arrow where there is a significant jump in demand of, ca of calories for both boys and girls. And primarily the reason is after about eight years old, most boys and most girls are going to go through the pubertal, the pubertal cycle soon. So they're, under gonna, they're going to undergo a significant growth spurt. They're gonna have significant hormonal changes in their body and their body is going to become incredibly metabolically active. And to meet the demand of all of that activity, we need to make sure they have enough calories and enough nourishment. And so I always highlight that because a lot of times children who are active in sports, even before they go through puberty, really need to be made aware that their nutritional challenges are going to change as they're going through the puberty cycle. And a lot of times this might be where we run into trouble, where we do a bad job providing the appropriate nutrition we need to provide. There are some differences that you'll see on this slide based on, on sex of the athlete. So males rather than females, because they put on more lean body mass than their female counterparts, their muscles are a little bit more metabolically active. And so they need a little bit more calories per age compared to their female counterparts. But that's not to say that females don't need much. As you can see on the slide, if you're a highly active female athlete, even as young as nine to 10 years old, you need to be getting about 2000 to 2200 calories per day just to meet the demands of your sport, as well as the baseline demands of your changing body. And so it's really important to know that because, um, I think that when people are asked to keep inventory of what they're actually eating and how much of it, they may find that they come up quite a bit short uh, compared to what is expected of them. And so one of the more sort of amusing things I like to do with patients is I just ask them to take me through a day of what they're eating. And I get some very interesting and sort of funny answers. And it's all very understandable. We are all living a very busy lot. Sorry, can I just cut you off really quick? Um, I, sure. I think there might be some issues where people are not seeing the all of the, the slides, uh, okay, just sure. the title slide. Um, so if I could just have people, um, if people want to maybe raise their hand, if they're having this issue, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to figure out if it's just, sure. oh, okay. Other people say they're changing. Okay. never mind then. Um, it might just be a problem for one person and hopefully we can send them the recording. Uh, anyway, okay, sorry. Got it. Continue on. So sorry for that one person. I apologize. Um, hopefully we can, you know, catch you up to speed, um, as you see the recording. Um, so as I was saying, one of the more amusing things I like to do is ask my athletes what they're like, what they like to eat throughout the course of the day. And understandably, they are, everybody's leading very busy lives. The athletes as well as parents and coaches are all leading very busy lives. So it's not always easy to make sure you're getting the right amount of nutrition. And usually I'm hearing things like, oh, I have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich on my way to school. And then sometimes I'm taking a bunch of AP classes and I'm skipping meals and I'm eating a bag of chips and a burger and maybe I'll drink a soda and I just need to get, be on the go. I don't eat anything before practice. And then I come home and I have a big heaping 
pile of pasta and then I go to sleep and then I do the, whole, the same thing over again. Of course, as you break all of that down, that's probably not the right approach for somebody who's involved in a lot of sports and is um, also undergoing significant metabolic changes as they're growing and developing. So when we talk about the caloric recommendations, what do we really care about? Well, we want boys to be getting about 22 to 2400 calories just if they're regular adolescent boys that are not even involved in sport. And then that can go up to as much as 3000 calories if they're very active. And a lot of the patients that we're talking about, a lot of your, you, you guys who are on the call, a lot of your own children and the, and the children that you're coaching are highly competitive. They're playing multiple days per week. They're playing multiple tournaments on the weekend. I would consider all of them to be at the highest level of participation. And so they need the appropriate nourishment to be able to match that, that level of demand. And additionally for girls, it's not, it's less, but it's not by much. I mean, we're still expecting our girls to be able to get 2,400 calories if they're very active in multiple sports or, or very, just very intense in even one sport. And particularly for boys and girls who are involved in activities that really emphasize a certain physique or leanness, whether that's intentional or unintentional. And some of those might be track and field, cross country, dance, gymnastics. We have to be really cognizant of the fact that there is a higher risk in that specific population that they may not be nourishing themselves well enough in order to meet some other demand that is expected of them. They'd be among the higher risk category for um, chronic undernourishment. So this is a quick example. Like if you have a 50 kilogram female adolescent basketball player, you could just do 50 kilo calories per kilogram per day as a rule of thumb. So you do 50 by 50, you get about 2,500 calories per day. So a highly competitive adolescent female who weighs about a normal weight um, would require about 2,500 calories a day. And I think when people go through and they calculate individually for their own, uh, for themselves, as well as their, their children, and they, they try to see, okay, are we really meeting that goal? The common thing that I hear in my experience is that, wow, we're quite, we're quite short. We're not quite reaching the, the exact place that we're supposed to be reaching. So as we talk about the macronutrients, we've talked about the calories, we'll, we'll talk about the, each of the three macronutrients. I'll spend the least amount of time on fats because it's relatively, um, it's, it, it's important, but it's relatively straightforward. We know that children need on demand, on, on average, a little bit higher demand of fats, healthy fats in their diet compared to the adult counterparts. So we would say about 25 to 35% of the daily caloric intake should be from healthy fats. Sources of healthy fats are like nuts, avocado, certain different types of fish. Um, certainly excessively greasy food would be a bad option and it would be more on the saturated fat side, which would be less healthy and less metabolically utilized by the body. But I'm not spending too much time on this because um, children don't necessarily one-to-one -one burn more fat for fuel than adults. So even though they're oxidizing more fat in their body, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going straight to um, being utilized for activity. And it's not like eating a fattier food is going to make you a better athlete from a nourishment standpoint. In fact, children, like I mentioned before, are undergoing period of rapid growth. And a lot of that growth is utilizing fats and the substrates that our body uses from fats to create hormones and other sorts of chemicals that are, impo that are important in the growth cycle. And so this isn't necessarily related to sport. It's just related to the general nutrition that we need to be watching over as our kids are growing and developing. Protein is incredibly important and we'll take some extra time to make sure we, we address this. Again, protein, just like fat, is not necessarily a particular source of energy that the body is utilizing for um, activity. But it, it only gives about three to 5% of the energy that you might expend during exercise. But we know that it's incredibly important for rebuilding proteins, both the micro and, and a macro structure of proteins that are involved in muscular growth, muscular recovery, as well as other processes. So th for that, for those reasons, it's incredibly important to make sure we're nourishing our children with the appropriate amount of protein, especially if they're a high level athlete. And it's also important to make sure, as I'll touch on later, that protein, in addition to carbohydrates, are taken in at the appropriate quantities to make sure that they're working hand in hand and making sure that we um, are, pro uh, are providing appropriate nutrition. So when we talk about a non-athlete first, we'll just we'll just set the set the basis here. Generally speaking, the regular non-athlete needs about 12 to 5 percent of their caloric intake to be protein. So if you arbitrarily pick a number between there, 13 percent, and the normal adult should get about 2,000 calories a day, you get about 260 calories. Every gram of protein has about four calories per gram. So if you do the math, you get every patient who is not an athlete and who is of adult of general adult weight should be consuming about 65 grams of protein per day. Now, the common, the, uh, the traditional Western American diet that is not too restrictive is easily going to hit that mark without even trying. 
uh, most of us are probably consuming 65 grams of protein a day if we're not on any particular sort of restrictive diet. Um, and so it's relatively easy for non-athletes to meet that goal. Now, the challenge is uh, with athletes, we pretty much have to double that. So when we go from what we just said about adults, where they need about 0.8 grams per kilo, if they're not active, if they're relatively sedentary, our highly metabolically active young athletes need about twice that, somewhere between 1.2 to 1.7 grams of protein per, ki per kilo. So if you have an 80 gram, so pardon me, an 80 kilogram child, they need to be getting in about 120 grams. Most of the time, they're still able to even get that. Um, the natural dri innate drive that they have for hunger during the, the growth process is, is enough to, to meet the demand um, with the resources we have available in the United States. But I, I always caution people to take inventory themselves, do the calculations, right? Use any of those free apps that are out there that, that can um, tally up exactly how many calories and, pro and grams of protein you're consuming per day and make sure you're actually hitting that mark. It's incredibly important. And then I, I commonly get asked about how to, what about gaining weight? Like how do, we, how do we advise our children how to safely gain weight? I am not a fan of any of the uh, you know, dirty bulking. I know there's a lot of different crazes out there about how to appropriately gain weight. The underlying idea is right, which is that we need to consume overall more nutrition. If you're trying to gain weight, you need to take in more energy in order to create a, a larger body. It, by principle, that is absolutely correct. However, just shoving things into your body for the sake of being able to consume more and more and relentlessly exercising is not the most efficient way and can be a little bit detrimental um, in, in other aspects. It can lead to problems related to metabolic syndrome, cardiovascular health, and those sorts of things. So rather than allowing patients or recommending that patients do that, I try to provide a more stepwise approach to how, how can you um, increase your, your, your weight in a healthy manner. It generally comes down to increasing your daily amount of, of protein intake and increasing your daily amount of carbohydrate intake. And as a consequence of raising both of those, you're going to end up taking in more calories in an appropriate amount of ways. So simply put, if you want to gain a kilogram of body weight, you generally want to consume about 1.5 grams of protein and 30 grams of carbohydrates in addition to what your baseline nutrition already is. So I have some simple calculations there. Four kilograms ends up being roughly about 10 pounds. So if you're trying to gain about 10 pounds, you want to make sure that every day you're consuming about six additional grams of protein and about 120 additional grams of carbohydrates. When you do that math, you end up getting an additional about 500 calories per day in order to make that, uh, that, that, that gain in weight um, your, if that's the goal, that's, that's how much you'd need to consume. Um, and then that's a, a relatively safe and reliable way to gain weight, um, without doing any of these, uh, sort of fab, uh, tricks to, to, to expedite the process where we know that in general, it's not safe to do. Um, and a lot of times it doesn't work. So going forward, we'll focus a little bit more on carbohydrates now. Um, so I generally recommend about seven grams of carbohydrates per kilo per day for an avid athlete. Um, and then if you're going to be involved in a metabolically active event, particularly in players who are doing a lot of running, jumping, cutting, pivoting sports. So these will be the track and field. These will be the soccer. This will be the football players. This will be lacrosse, rugby, um, cross country, those sorts of things. And particularly as it is interesting to soccer players, we know that soccer players consume a tremendous amount of energy during their sport. They are running all over the field um, and they're practically running a, a little bit of a mini marathon during their 90 minutes of play. And so they're highly metabolically active. And there are some instances where they're playing more than one game in the same day or more than one game on a weekend. And to be mindful of that, we need to make sure we're pro providing appropriate carbohydrates because this is the primary fuel source that your body utilizes for energy. So I usually say that during activity and, and training, seven grams per kilo is appropriate. But as you're leading up to your activity, you want to consume closer to 10 grams per kilo. Um, and I, I do give some general guidelines as we're approaching the days of play. If it's an early morning game, I recommend eating a relatively heavier meal towards bedtime with a lighter snack a couple of hours before game day. Um, and then to consume a little bit of carbohydrates throughout competition. And we'll talk about a little bit more about the nitty gritty of the numbers in, in, in a second. I do ask not that athletes don't ingest too much carbohydrates soon before their game. So certainly nothing within an hour that's too large of a, of a meal. And the reason is simple. It's because when you consume a meal that's heavy in carbohydrates, your insulin increases substantially in order to make sure that the carbohydrates that you're consuming are being utilized properly. And what does insulin do? It takes sugar out of the bloodstream and puts it inside of cells. 
Um, but we don't want that. We want we want glucose to be free flowing in the blood during activity. And so when you when you eat a meal right before activity and you consume a large meal and then you go and try to do a very metabolically demanding sport like soccer, you'll feel very faint, dizzy, nauseated, maybe have a headache. You'll feel quite un unwell very quickly because you have insulin trying to put the glucose away. And then you have muscle cells that are working, trying to consume the glucose from the blood. So you end up in a, in a situation where your brain can have less glucose available for it. And then you feel dizzy and, and you don't feel well. Um, in addition, I would consider that patients use more of a protein heavy and low, glyce low glycemic index food um, in addition to carbohydrates just prior to sport to slow down the absorption and to avoid that insulin spike. So that basically means don't consume a very carbohydrate rich meal an hour before, don't eat a bowl of pasta before you're gonna play a game. In general, a lot of people may tolerate that, but it may come at the deficit of, of that phenomenon that I just described. So in terms of in-game recommendations, we always wanna talk about planning ahead. I usually say to replenish carbohydrates, which can be done through liquid means as well as through food itself, about every half hour as you're going through your metabolically active game. Using high glycemic index foods during the game to facilitate up absorption is a good idea. So having a heavier carb snack during the game is fine. Fruits are usually an excellent source of this, particularly things like apples, bananas, um, and oranges. Uh, we're not trying to build, you're not trying to gain weight in the middle of a game. You're not trying to do any training measures during a game. So you're not trying to take protein bars and those sorts of things right in the middle of a game. Um, you can certainly, but generally a lot of protein bars can slow down absorption and cause issues while you're trying to play that may not be that may be detrimental to you. So using other um, util utilization of carbohydrates that are going to be easily accessible by your body for your muscles to use as energy would be a better way of going about it in the middle of your competition. Um, and some small amounts of liquid carbohydrates are also an, a good avenue to use because they quickly become absorbed by the gut and can be utilized by the body. Um, but again, as I mentioned many times already, just don't overdo it. The body can't absorb much more than 30 to 60 grams of carbohydrates at any one, one given time. And I would argue that that 60 grams is quite on the higher side. You need to be sort of a freak athlete to be able to consume that much and not feel any ill effects. So we don't wanna be consuming large meals in the middle of games or at halftime or something like that because your body's really not gonna be able to handle it and you're gonna have some issues related to GI side effects from that. Post-game recommendations are to generally, you wanna refuel as soon as you can after your sport. Um, and especially if you've got multiple games in, in a short period of time. So about one gram of carbs, one gram of carbs per kilo between games. Ideally, as you're recovering, as you're consuming a meal, consuming an energy, pardon me, not an energy drink, consuming a protein shake, for example, um, after your meal, you wanna find one that's about a three to one carbohydrate to protein ratio. Um, and now at this point, since you're trying to recover and replenish the glucose you've, you've used, utilizing higher glycemic index foods after activity would be perfectly appropriate because you're not expecting your body to go right back in and play another game. You're allowing the body to recover. And so additional carbohydrates are safe in this situation and probably would be advantageous to you. And I usually tell athletes to consume something about two to three hours after their, after their sport. I don't really want you to go much longer than that because there is a nice window that you have that roughly is about four hours long from the end of your activity until which you can consume food and your muscle cells and your very metabolically active tissue will be able to utilize that food to rebuild. It's not that it's not effective after that four hours, but there seems to be a prime window there where it seems to be the most effective. So I try to tell my athletes not to, not to go too long without consuming appropriate nutrition after competitive um, activity, particularly competitive games. Um, so we'll go forward towards fluids here. And then of course, at the end, like I mentioned, we'll have plenty of time for questions. So in general, when we talk about hydration, we talk about consuming roughly about half a liter or 500 mLs of fluid four hours prior to competition. And I tell athletes, see how your urine is. If it continues to be dark, this is a very dirty test of, of appropriate uh, hydration, but it does work in most people. If it continues to be pretty dark, then about two hours before, do another 250 mLs or 300. And then another of that about 20 minutes before. Ideally, and we'll talk about why, you wanna have a pretty dilute glucose electrolyte solution to replenish water loss. I'll, I'll, I'll explain exactly what I mean by that. Um, water absorption is driven by a gradient where sodium and glucose are absorbed with the water from the gut into your body. And too much glucose ends up slowing intestinal absorption. And this is a really important point that I wanna make sure everybody is, is aware of. 
This is a uh, pictogram of a cell in your intestine that is in charge of absorbing water. The left, the left side of the screen, and if you can see my marker here, um, is the inside of your intestines. This is the cell that absorbs fluid and water. And then this is the rest of your body, your blood cells, your muscles, all that sort of stuff. The key point to understand is that when you consume fluids, fluids go across this cell when sodium and glucose are absorbed. So it, the primary way of getting water into your body is by also absorbing sodium and glucose. And so when you consume an electrolyte solution that has a ton of glucose in it and not much sodium, that water actually sits inside of the intestines and absorbs much slower than you would want it to. If you consume something that's equal amounts of glucose and sodium, it's a little bit better, but still a little slow. If you consume a dilute solution of water that's pretty rich in sodium and less rich in glucose, that seems to work the best. That really pushes fluids into the body and is appropriate for nutrition, pardon me, appropriate for hydration. So ideally what we want is a carbohydrate and electrolyte containing solution that is what we call hypotonic, which means that it is less concentrated than the cell that it's trying to go into. When you have two different things of different concentrations and an osmotic gradient in between, water goes from areas of lower concentration to higher concentration, and you're simply trying to create that same environment when you're pro providing hydration to your body. I would say that most popular commercial sports drinks are too high in osmolarity. That makes them too hypertonic for this, for this exact situation. And they get their osmolarity by being very high in their glucose uh, pr um, uh, content. So when you have a higher glucose content, your overall solution is not as dilute as you want it to be. The glucose and the water sits in your gut. It usually makes you feel bad. You don't feel as well. And it also is not effective in hydrating you. And so just to highlight that, as you're, as you're replenishing yourself every 20 to 30 minutes with fluid, if you use Gatorade, for example, a typical 32 ounce Gatorade or one liter of fluid of Gatorade has about 54 grams of carbohydrates in it. Whereas Pedialyte Sport, the same amount of fluid has only 14 grams of carbs in it and a significant higher concentration of sodium and potassium, which is really necessary for appropriate nutrition and it, pardon me, appropriate hydration. And this is particularly true when you're uh, expelling a lot of, of your electrolytes from sweat because sweat is not only your uh, water leaving your body, it's also quite a bit of salt leaving your body. And so when you're losing that in sweat, you wanna have an adequate way of, of replenishing that as you're, as you're competing. I, I think the complications for hydration can be avoided if you're not doing activity that's much more than an hour. If you have relatively mild practices, it's not necessary that you need to have this particular sort of magic solution to drink in order to provide appropriate hydration. Um, and then if you wanna be perfect, you need to take in about 1.5 times in terms of fluid volume compared to what you lost. The best way to do that is to measure pre and post exercise weights to see how much you end up losing in fluids and then replenish that over a period of the next several hours by using a calculation that multiplies that weight by 1.5. Um, it's not always easy to do that, to do, to do pre and post um, exercise weights. And so those previous recommendations I provided are perfectly adequate for meeting the, the goals. So this is just a quick snapshot of everything we just talked about that hopefully um, summarizes things nicely in an easy and digestible way. In general, we know boys and girls need significant amounts of calories, especially if they're competitive in sport. Um, boys need a little bit more, but girls certainly need a lot. We talked about how much grams of, of protein per kilo body weight that most active adolescents need just to maintain their weight. And we talked about six grams per protein, six grams per kilogram of weight of protein to gain per kilo that you would like to, and 30 of carbohydrates per kilo that you would like to. Um, just to maintain carbohydrate uh, stores in active athletes, we want seven grams of carbohydrates per kilo, and we jump that up to 10 a couple of days before activity. Fats are your friends. They're not to be avoided, but we don't want to exceed more than 30% of your daily caloric intake to come from fats. Half a liter of a, uh, of a water solution or a hypotonic electrolyte and glucose containing solution two to three hours before sport is adequate um, hydration. And then a couple of extra 100 mLs before sport. Um, and then carb containing fluids only if you're going to be competing for more than one hour. So we'll talk about the micronutrients real quick. There's not many that we need to really touch on. The big ones are usually related to iron, which is really important for uh, endurance athletes, of which we consider soccer somewhat to be on that spectrum. Um, the changes that of iron um, utilization 
is important to note when you have athletes that are undergoing puberty. Um, you can see that for most of these situations, um, you need about beyond that, that, that highly metabolic period, you need about 11 milligrams for boys and 15 for girls. And then before that period, you have some different numbers there. By and large, unless you're very restrictive, particularly highly vegan or vegetarian, you should be able to get most of the iron you need from a general diet that you're consuming. Um, if you are vegan, if you are vegetarian, or you have any specific restrictions to particular food sources, and you might be concerned about your iron, um, it's certainly appropriate to see, you know, somebody that that can can look into that nutrition facts for you, provide you with some advice, even check an iron level and 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 a, what we call a ferritin, in order to get an idea of, of if everything is being met appropriately. Calcium, again, we need about 1300 milligrams, both for boys and girls, once they've reached their um, adult match even up to leading up to puberty and, and their adult maturation um, phase. Um, and again, this is relatively easy to obtain um, from most of the, the, the uh, traditional Western diet that we're exposed to. It's, as I've mentioned that several times now, if you, if you do find yourself in the camp of, of somebody who's highly restrictive, um, it can get a little bit tricky to make sure that you don't have any nutritional deficiencies, both from a macronutrient and micronutrient standpoint. And it requires kind of more of an in-depth one-on-one -on -one conversation to go through your entire profile of what you're consuming and try to see what deficiencies there might be in particular uh, parts of nutrition that you might be lacking and then how to appropriately replace that. So we'll talk very briefly about supplements. So I will talk about the ones that we know that there seems to be the highest evidence to support. Creatine is a supplement that is relatively easy to obtain over the counter and relatively inexpensive. The idea behind creatine is that it provides a high energy phosphate bond to your muscle cells so that they can continue to work and put out power um, even when they might be in another situation starting to lose that power. It's been pretty extensively studied in adults and it seems to be pretty safe for kids at least at the age of 15 and older. It's probably safer for, safe for kids even younger than that age. It just hasn't been examined quite that much. It has, it, as long as you take about five grams of creatine per day, it is going to have some very modest improvements in overall uh, strength and power output. It, it might not necessarily be all that helpful to endurance athletes. So I'm not quite sure that most soccer players would benefit very much from taking regular creatine. Certainly it can help. I think it would provide some strength benefits, but I'm not convinced that it would make a big difference. Now I would say it makes a bigger difference for somebody like who's an offensive lineman in football who needs that excess energy and excess muscle power output. It might make a big difference for their day-to-day but it's probably not going to add much more to your ability to cross, to, to do a cross field pass if you're playing soccer um, or something like that. So, and it's certainly not a nutritional replacement. It is simply a supplement. Now, caffeine is another um, supplement that I consider that's been studied extensively in sport. And it does show a very mild ergometric improvement in terms of activity. And I usually say like, about 50 milligrams of caffeine 50 minutes before sport. So that's about six ounces of black coffee before you play can have a very, very mild improvement in your focus and performance. Again, for kids younger than 12, we don't have any evidence that it is helpful or harmful. We just haven't looked into it. And I, again, this is something that I say is the least important thing. Um, but it, if, if, if all the other things are being met appropriately and you want a little bit of a competitive edge, a little bit of caffeine prior to sport, particularly on competition days, can probably be helpful. I do say that with some caution and I say, please don't think that I'm recommending anybody take caffeine pills, energy supplements, or anything like that. The safest way to do this would be to consume tea or coffee that consumes a reliable amount of caffeine in it and not any of these energy drinks that have 200, 300, 400 milligrams of caffeine. That's definitely not what my recommendation would be. And as I've already said, I would rather we are very methodical and careful with all of the uh, consumption of nutrition and hydration before we even worry about caffeine. So on that note, what I usually say is that we need to talk about the pillars of health and wellness, which is true for us as adults, and it's certainly true for children. We have to maximize and optimize our appropriate nutrition. We have to maximize and optimize our hydration. We really need to make sure our children are sleeping enough. Somewhere between eight and a half to nine and a half hours of sleep in a developing child is important. Um, and then exercise, which is sort of uh, easy for us as we have who we're talking about athletes and um, and they're already getting robust amounts of exercise. And then lastly, appropriate amounts of social interaction within the family, within appropriate peer groups and friends um, is, is incredibly important. If we meet these five pillars, 
supplements and all of the other sorts of minor aids that are that are constantly um, shown to us through media and other forms um, are really not going to make much of a difference um, in a patient who has all of the other five, five pillars met. And I would say trying to use a supplement to overcome any of the deficits that we might run into from not doing one of the other five pillars would be uh, the wrong direction to go. So if you're not eating enough, if you're not sleeping well enough, and you're trying to overcome that by consuming more caffeine, we're, we're probably not, not doing the right thing. We need to address one of these pillars if, if there's a deficit. And we would go farther in doing that. All right, so uh, apologize if I spoke a little quickly, but I did wanna get through all the slides so people had enough time to ask questions and I'm happy to uh, address any and all of them that we have today. Thank you so much, Dr. Balaji. And, and yeah, we will be sending out the recording. Um, so we can, you can take another listen. I think, yeah, there's a lot of great content there. And thank you to everyone for submitting your questions. Um, so the first question, um, is about um, a, a 10 year old uh, and gaining weight is tough for her because uh, she's very active. Um, and you know, her, her parents, I guess, are wondering if there are any uh, maybe more impactful meals, you know, if there's any like tips you have for really like maybe high protein or, um, you know, efficient foods that would be good to, to help her gain weight a little bit. Uh, and also uh, if you have any thoughts around the timing of meals. If there's a good way to, to time them to, to help her gain weight. Yeah, it's an excellent question. Um, ten years, a, a child that's a boy or a girl at the age of ten is highly metabolically active. So that's really the type of of child that I would say, if you're a very active athlete at that age, um, you're going to have a significant high demand of calories in order to be able to not only not even gain weight, just to maintain what you're what you're at. Um, so the first advice I have for parents in this situation is to just document and keep track of what, what a child is actually eating throughout the day. Get like a week or two weeks worth of data. And you can use any of those, like I mentioned, apps online or on, the, uh, on, on mobile apps um, that, that tracks exactly how much calories is in each thing that you eat and how much macronutrients are in each, each thing and tally it up. At that age, I would expect about 2,000 to 2,100 calories per day would be required just to maintain weight and then a little bit more than that to gain. And so if we're trying to gain weight, I mean, I, I feel like I'm already putting quite a challenge ahead of most parents when they say you need to make sure your 10 year old is consuming 2300 calories a day. It's, it's actually not that easy to do. Um, and so that would be the first thing I would say, get an idea of how much she's consuming and then figure out how much more she needs to do. Protein rich meals would be most as long as you're not restricted to, to any sorts of um, of um, uh, sources of, of, of meat products. Most meat products have robust amounts of protein in them. So chicken, turkey, those are excellent sources. Even red meats are perfectly good for that, such as steak and those sorts of things. If you're restricted from that standpoint, nowadays there are lots of vegan and vegetarian appropriate uh, protein rich options that people can look to. Um, if they do a little bit of research online to sort of uncover which ones um, uh, have a lot of protein in them. The only caveat is that some of them can be quite expensive, which can be difficult, um, but they're certainly out there. Protein shakes, I think, are absolutely suitable to consume. The, the problem with protein shakes in general is that not all of them are uh, arduously tested. And so it's not always the case that when you just buy any protein shake, you're actually getting what's on the label in the product. And that's because the FDA doesn't oversee, pro proteins are considered a supplement and they're not overseen by the FDA. And so the FDA is not going around to every company ensuring the quality of every product. There are some third party tests out there that will sort of stamp their label onto protein shakes that they've tested and say, yes, this, this particular product does have in it what, what they claim to have in it. Um, but that's not every, every pro that's not to say that every protein shake is, is, has that or even needs that. I do know, and again, like I said, I have no conflicts of interest to disclose, and this company has uh, no affiliation with me directly or indirectly, but uh, a company named Optimum Nutrition creates a protein product called Gold Standard. It's really easily commercially available. It's a company that's based out of England, um, and their product has been tested over and over again and truly has the, the actual thing in it that they advertise is in it. So their nutritional facts are adequate. So something like that, a protein source, a couple of protein shakes per day, um, looking through the fine print and making sure there's no allergies um, and, and no dietary restrictions as you're, as you're doing this, that would be a good way to get your protein intake and increase your caloric intake in a simple uh, and effective way. So I usually recommend something like that um, for patients who are, who are trying to make sure their child is getting the appropriate kind of nutrition. Thanks so much. Um, and kind of related to that, you touched on this a little bit, um, but um, there was a question around, you know, how should vegetarians um, meet, uh, you know, these, um, nutrition guidelines that you've laid out for us, and then specifically, um, 
vegetarian calcium sources uh, with the highest calcium density? Yeah, so that, that can be a little bit tough. If you're vegetarian but not vegan, there's significant caloric uh, availabilities to you in the, in, the, in the dairy department of most super super uh, markets. And so if you look through the different sorts of available products there, most of them will have high, high value in terms of calcium. Um, that could be a, definitely a bit of a challenge, though, if you're vegan, because you're probably not going to be willing to be consuming those sorts of pro animal products, which is totally understandable. Um, at that point, I would usually say that you you might be one of those patients that might benefit from just taking exogenous calcium as a supplement if you're truly at a deficit. If you're if, if everything else you're consuming is truly not ma meeting your appropriate calcium intake and you are have a very restrictive diet, you might be one of those patients that that might, might be advisable to take a, a take exogenous calcium in the form of a supplement in order to in order to make up that that. Uh, that that um, deficit that you may have. Um, in terms of protein sources for vegetarians, there are plenty that are available. Most lentils and beans and those sorts of things contain good amounts of protein. Uh, most nuts contain good amounts of protein as well. Um, peanut butters, those sorts of things, certainly are vegetarian and, and contain protein. It can be a little bit tricky and requires a little bit of, um, uh, of working to, to figure exactly how to do it. Um, there are, again, as I've mentioned, there are a lot of protein supplements out there that are tested and are reliable and um, are even vegetarian and vegan friendly and do contain, do contain quite a bit of, of protein and calories within one scoop. And so I, I would say that most people should just do their research and see which one of those seems to be the most um, authenticated and the most useful. There's so many out there that, you know, by the time I, I've even found one, They've either been taken off the shelf or been replaced by another company. And so it's been difficult to figure out exactly which way to send patients. And so I sort of had to give up because it's such a, a dramatically changing industry. Um, and so uh, that, that's what I would recommend for, the, for, the, for those out, out there that are more restrictive diets, vegans and vegetarians. Thanks so much. And um, maybe you could also talk a little bit about eggs. Uh, we had a question about how many eggs per day, you know, um, athletic boy. I mean, they said specifically 11 years old, but uh, if there's any, you know, are there, is there such a thing as too many? I don't know if there's concern around cholesterol, <laughs> things like that. Yeah, that's the, consuming eggs is such an interesting topic in medicine. Um, we never know exactly how much we should be recommending people to consume because there is, as you mentioned, there is a high um, cholesterol uh, a content in each egg. Each egg has roughly around seven to nine grams of protein in it. And so that is a quite a bit of protein. Um, I would say that for most adults, even about three to four eggs is probably the maximum you'd want to be consuming. Um, and that's mainly to say that I, I I don't want any person to consume any one ingredient or one product too much because it's just going to come at the deficit of other things you should be eating that have other other ingredient profiles that are important for your body. So technically speaking, you could probably just live off of eggs, at least for a short amount of time. But after that short amount of time, you're not going to have the other nu important nutrition that's required for your bodily function. And so for those reasons, I would say, even if there may not be an upper limit of the number of eggs that are healthy, I wouldn't consume much more than three or four, because you want to make sure you eat other things that provide your body with other things that eggs don't have that are important for you. So that would be kind of how I would approach that, that, that problem. Thank you. Um, and can you uh, clarify, what's a liquid carbohydrate? Oh, a liquid carbohydrate is just any fluid that you can drink that has uh, some level of glucose within it. So you can look on the back of any sort of, you know, uh, Pedialyte or Pedialyte Sport or any of these other products and just look on the back and see how much glucose is in it. That's just a liquid, liquid um, uh, carbohydrate. And what I, what I was trying to get at is that having just water that has no sugar in it is not a terrible plan, is perfectly suitable. But if you're sweating a lot and you're doing long durations of activity, then water alone is not as effective as having a dilute liquid carbohydrate solution that has sodium and potassium in it. That would be a little bit better in those particular scenarios. So if you're only working out for about an hour, water is, would be all you need. If you're really running all over the field for, for soccer um, and you're playing a long game, then water alone is not bad but you could optimize your hydration by consuming something like Pedialyte Sport that has a little bit of glucose, i.e. carbohydrate in it, as well as sodium and potassium to replenish what you're losing in your sweat. Thank you. And how about coconut water to hydrate during or after a game? Yeah, again, good good question. Coconut water, it, I I think it's dependent on the type of coconut water that's that you're consuming. If you just like crack open a coconut and drink the water, I have no idea. Like every coconut has a different concentration of what, what exactly the glucose and the potassium and stuff is in it. So it's kind of hard to measure. 
if you are going to buy any of the commercially available coconut waters, I ask that you just look on the back and see how many grams of carbohydrates are in each serving, how much sodium and how much potassium is in it. You basically want something that has about six to 8% carbohydrate solution. So that would be something like 10 to 12 grams of carbohydrate per, per liter of fluid, something like that. Um, and then you want to consume um, uh, something that has about like 400 to 500 um, uh, milligrams of sodium and somewhere around the same potassium. That would be like an ideal isotonic liquid carbohydrate solution. Um, I don't think a lot of the the coconut waters that are sold commercial, commercially in the brands that I've seen have that to a perfect T, but there may be something out, some brand out there that does do that well. Um, but I would say that, you know, coconut water, colloquially speaking, has been used for endurance activities and has, you know, at least anecdotally has been proven to be quite effective. I would say that if you end up finding coconut water or like just straight up coconuts that seem too sweet, you can always dilute them with water and drink it and get the same effect. Thank you. Okay, a few more questions on drinks. Um, so sure. Uh, instead of something like Pedialyte Sport or Gatorade, how, how does something like uh, Liquid IV compare to, to that? And, and would you recommend something like li Liquid IV for a young athlete? Yeah. yeah, great question. So Liquid IV is a, is a product I'm relatively familiar with. I actually looked on, just in preparation for this talk, I actually bought a little bit of it and looked on the back of the nutritional facts. I would say it's actually pretty good. I would say that um, they... Uh, they advertise that they could they put a lot of vitamins in their in their um, uh, in their product, which is not a bad thing, but it probably isn't necessary. Like I'm I, I'm not convinced that a healthy child who's consuming a good diet really needs the vitamin content that's in liquid IV hydration. Um, but apart from that, it does seem to have the appropriate amount of of carbohydrates in it, and it does seem to have the appropriate amount of sodium and potassium and other electrolytes in it. Um, so what I would recommend is that uh, from what I understood the single packets of something like liquid IV should be dissolved in at least 16 ounces of water and nothing less than that. So I would, I would definitely recommend consuming the product within, don't, don't put it in like a regular glass of water. It's going to be too concentrated. It's not going to be what you want. You want to make sure that you dilute it down appropriately based on the nutritional facts that's on the, on the, on the box. And if I remember correctly from reading it, it said about 16 ounces, which is about two cups of, of just standard cups of water. Um, but I think it's actually seems to be a pretty decent product and I think it would be safe to use. Okay. Thank you. Um, and how about prime? I don't, I'm not familiar with that one, but I don't know if you've heard of that one either. <laughs> I am very familiar with it. I get questions about prime energy drinks all the time. Um, there seems to be different types of products of prime. The conventional prime energy drink is like truly an energy drink and has about 200 milligrams of caffeine per serving, or maybe it's in the entire bottle. That's way too much. It's, it's going to make people jittery. I don't think it, it, it may have no effect, but it also doesn't help. The other content in it is not very good. It doesn't have, it has too much sugar and it doesn't have the right amount of, um, of, of electrolytes. So I've generally steered people away from prime if they're trying to use it to, as an adequate um, sports drink. I don't think it does what it's supposed to do. Um, I'm not too sure about the other derivatives of the same company. They have some like prime hydration, prime this, prime that. I haven't had time to like look at each and every single one of those and see if any of them are any better than their regular drink that they have advertised the most. Um, but I would just say, look on the nutritional facts, look to see that they have maybe 10 to 12 grams of carbohydrates and that they have about a couple hundred milligrams of sodium, a couple hundred milligrams of potassium. If they put vitamins in there, so be it, probably not a big deal. Um, but then just make sure that they're not too heavy on the caffeine or too heavy on the glucose um, part, of, part of the drink. And it probably would be just fine. Awesome. Um, okay. How about drinking like homemade fruit juice or smoothies, uh, like in between games or after games? Uh, is that a good yeah. hydration? Yeah, that would probably be a good, that, that would be a perfect way. Maybe not for the hydration part of this, but as I mentioned that during games from a carbohydrate standpoint, you do want to consume something that has sugar in it that is not too high of a quality. As I was going through the slides, I said, um, you know, juice, uh, I'm sorry, pardon me, fruits would be a good option. And I think um, consuming smoothies in the form of blended fruits would, would be perfectly fine. Keep in, keep in mind though, that like blending down an entire banana and then drinking it really is quite a bit of sugar fast, um, compared to just eating the banana slowly over a period of five to 10 minutes. So there is a difference that your body detects in the way you're consuming it, even though it's literally the same thing. And so you may feel that if you do too many blended fruits or too many juiced fruits and you suck down a lot of it, it may have not the best effect on your GI tract because that's quite a bit of, 
of 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 um of uh sugar that you're consuming all at once and so i would just be a little bit careful not to do too much of it at once but if you need to do something quick that would be a suitable way of doing it um because you, as you can imagine if you blend nobody would do this because it wouldn't taste very good but if you blend a strawberry an apple a banana and an orange all together you could probably drink that fast that wouldn't be very difficult for you but that's quite a bit of sugar imagine eating each one of those fruits individually it would take you quite a bit of time to be able to do that and so in that vein what i'm trying to say is don't do too many fruits all at once and consume it because it's going to be pretty high glucose load. You don't want that when you're participating. Participating. Thank you. Okay, I think last question about drinks. Um, how about something like sure. smart water? <laughs> it doesn't, you know, it doesn't yeah. have any carbs or calories, but it does it help with electrolyte replenishment? Um, I think that so again with smart water, the the conventional ones that I've seen don't seem to have much of anything. So it just seems like regular water. And so that would be perfectly fine um, as long as you're not doing much more than an hour of activity and it's not very high intensity. Um, but if it's any of the derivatives of smart water that I've seen where there's some flavoring in it and there's this or there's that, again, I would just look on the back and see exactly what's in it. Try to avoid anything with too much caffeine, which I don't think smart water has any, so it shouldn't be a problem. And just make sure that the glucose that they have in there is not much higher than something like 12 grams. Um, and then it should be totally fine. Um, so, but I, I think that if I had to pick one, if I had, if I had patients saying, well, what's the one that you would want to do? I would say something like Pedialyte Sport. Um, and then as recently as I've seen Liquid IV, those both seem to be pretty good products for appropriate hydration. Thank you. Um, so how about just, you know, in regular daily eating, not, not related to, you know, hydrating after a game, how about milk? Um, is there one that's better, you know, regular cow's milk? And if so, should you do full fat, 2%, no fat and um, almond milk, you know, other types of, um, you know, nut milks or, or soy milk or things like that, hot milk. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I would say that if you are somebody who doesn't have a lactose intolerance or some other um, dietary restriction, vegan or otherwise, that prevents you from consuming whole milk, I think it would be perfectly suitable and perfectly fine to drink appropriate amounts of whole milk during the day. Um, that, and most athletes that I know usually use a little bit of milk to make their protein shakes. And that's perfectly fine. Um, as long as you don't have any um, uh, medical conditions that would make it a problem for you, um, that would be fine. And as long as you don't have uh, any dietary restrictions. Um, and I also, the, I caution, I'll say the next thing. There are fads out there where like people are drinking a gallon of milk a day as if that's supposed to be some sort of like amazing formula for gaining mass or I don't recommend that. I, I don't think that's the right way to go. That's that's a tremendous amount of milk. Um, it, and like I've said before, it's taking away from other things you should be eating that are going to provide you more important nutrition. So one glass of milk has about eight grams of protein in it, which is quite good. Eight grams of protein is really, really good. Um, and it also has sugar in it. And so it's an ener it's an excellent drink, particularly things like chocolate milk is a great drink for if you're drinking eight ounces of it and you're consuming it after intense activity, it's actually pretty good at replenishing the muscles that have been working so hard until that until that glass of milk. It is not a good idea to be consuming lots of chocolate milk, just regular sitting around, not doing anything. Um, I'm not sure it has much of an advantage to you. Maybe one glass of it occasionally would be fine, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't rely too much on it for any sort. Like I wouldn't imagine that it's doing something important for you. And that glucose load, if you're not an active person, may be doing some deleterious effects to you. Thank you so much. Okay, we have a couple questions around female athletes. Um, sure. How is there anything that you should change about nutrition intake during menstruation? Um, and then I think there was another one. Sorry, I'm trying to like combine them. But yeah, maybe. Um, oh, in sure. uh, increasing ferritin. Um, apparently, iron levels are normal, but ferritin is consistently low among some of the athletes who have uh, started menstruation and um, any tips to help with those things? Yeah, absolutely. Great questions. So I would say that in my personal experience, when we're taking care of female athletes, particularly as the question provider gave about those that are in entering menstruation, we have to keep in mind that when, when young girls are going through puberty and going through their menstrual cycles, their caloric demands are really going up pretty fast over a short period of time. So we really need to make sure they're eating enough. And in today's day and age, as I've said many times, we really should be writing down and documenting what they're eating and getting an idea if it's enough. We shouldn't just go based on our feelings or thoughts or what 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 our own parents wanted us to do. I, I mean, those are all probably okay to do, but if we wanna be nitty gritty about it and make sure we're doing a good job, we should keep track of it. We should use any of these online tables or mobile apps and figure out exactly how many calories is she consuming? 
how much protein, how much carbohydrates, how much fat, and break it down, keep track of it over a period of a week or two. I will say, when it comes to young girls who are starting their periods, usually within the first year or so that the periods have started, they can be quite irregular and that's relatively normal. After the first year, it should become quite regular. After you have attained regular cycles, if you are an intensely training athlete and your cycles are starting to become irregular or you are missing your cycles, I really want that person, that, that child, to feel comfortable telling that to their parents and their parents bringing that to the attention of somebody like me or the pediatrician who's involved in that family or the family medicine doctor. Because developing abnormal menstrual cycles after you've been normal is a problem we need to be talking about because it's one of the first indicators that we're not doing a good job providing nutrition for our bodies. I know that a lot of us may have grown up in the era where it was relatively normal for, for example, female track, track and field runners or cross country runners to attain a quote unquote level of fitness that they've lost their cycles. And it was just sort of like, oh, that's just what happens during track season. That is what we've come to learn is that that's not normal. We should not be ignoring that. We should not be normalizing that. We should be carefully investigating why that's happening to girls. And we should be making sure that we're doing a good job providing nutrition for the for those situations because we're probably undernourishing that child. And that may have long-term effects, some of which may be irreversible. We need to be very, very careful of. And so I'm really passionate about that because this is a hole in our in our society that we really can fill quite easily if we're just paying more attention. And so providing more nutrition during that very vulnerable period is incredibly important. And watching out for the warning signs that are happening during that time is also incredibly important. Um, and then I think there was another question you had about maybe a slightly younger child that was also related to being a girl. Could you repeat that one for me real quick? Yeah, um, I think um, there was a concern that athletes, especially those who are starting menstruation, uh, had low ferritin levels. And how to Got improve it. that? Yes, yeah, so ferritin. It's, this is a tricky topic. And so um, what we know about ferritin in general is that it is a molecule we can measure in people's blood that is a marker of iron stores. So it's a marker of how well your body is holding on to iron to be able to release it into the blood um, for utilization by your body. Iron is most important in your red blood cells for the sake of carrying oxygen around to the entire body. So iron is a very important micronutrient. What we've learned recently is that young endurance athletes may actually be suffering from a somewhat silent iron deficiency where we check their iron levels and they're normal, but their ferritin levels are abnormal and they're slightly low. And what we found is that if we supplement the iron in patients who have this, this sort of silent iron deficiency, they have improvements in their overall function in their sport and they seem to be feeling better. It's really interesting. And that idea is relatively, it's not novel, but it's the, the intricacies of what's happening we're just now starting to understand. So in that vein, I usually say, this is kind of a patient to patient thing. I would say that if you have an athlete who's an endurance sport athlete, I consider soccer part of that, as I mentioned already, and you're concerned about that for your child, I would bring it up to your, your child's pediatrician or family medicine doctor and bring it to their attention and talk about it. Um, you may be in that, in that window where your iron is normal, but your ferritin is somewhat low and supplementing you with iron and bumping up your ferritin will actually have some improvements for you. Now, I would say that if you're somebody who has that situation already, you might just want to see what, what, what your child is eating and figure out if you can supplement iron without having to buy it over the counter or get a prescription for it. Because supplementing with iron through the prescription uh, method is a little bit difficult because iron tablets hurt the stomach quite a bit and they, they cause quite a bit of GI distress. Um, and then to, you also have to like really like orange juice because consuming it with some sort of citric acid improves its absorption. And so there's a lot of intricacies with how to consume iron that that make it kind of a challenge sometimes. So if you can avoid it and just improve your intake of iron through other sources, then um, that would be that would be a better option. You can get iron through many, many sources, um, you know, meat products included, but also certain vegetable products and leafy green vegetables in particular. Um, and so there's other ways of just increasing the amount of iron your child is consuming naturally rather than even having to resort to a supplement. Thank you so much. Um I just want to do a quick time check with you, Dr. Balaji. We still have a lot of sure. questions to go through. Is it okay if I pick a few more? Uh, yeah, I'm perfectly perfectly fine with that. Yeah, is every, if everybody else is okay uh, listening in, I'm, I'm perfectly fine with answering more questions as we go along here. Okay, great. I'll, I'll pick a few more that are kind of hopefully, uh, it seems like multiple people are asking the same questions. And then for everyone else, yeah. I'll put some information in the chat about how you can get more information from, from our team. Um, 
So uh, Dr. Balaji, what's your opinion on energy gels or chews, especially for, for people who do a lot of running? And then mm -hmm. uh, what's your opinion on kids having protein bars? And is there like one that's best for kids? Yeah, so the protein, so I'll answer the, the gels first and then I'll go back to the protein bars. So um, different companies make different gels. I know Gatorade has been one that has been producing gels for quite a bit of time. Now there's been a lot of copycats because that's just the way that uh, this industry goes is that you have one successful product and everybody wants to produce the same thing. I would say that if the gel product, I would just look at the nutrition facts and figure out how much carbohydrates is actually in each gel product. If it's considerably more than 15 grams of carbohydrates, it may cause you to have um, some, I don't know how much people feel it, but it may cause your insulin to spike before activity. Um, and it may cause some GI problems some just abdominal pain. It's not dangerous by any sense, but it's not, it might not be ideal. So I would just check what each one has. If it has like 50 grams, it, that's like a sugar cube. It's not good for you. It probably won't help. Um, but if it has something along the lines of like 15 grams, 20 grams, something like that, it's probably reasonable to consume. I don't know off the top of my head what each one, each one of these brands consumes or rather puts in, in each of these packets. Um, but I would say that that would be a generally good guideline for utilization. If that's what it has, it's probably safe. I would carefully look through the nutrition effects and make sure it doesn't have any other weird ingredients that don't make sense. Um, I don't know what sort of artificial sweeteners they might put in it in addition to their regular sugar. And if any of that is a concern, I would recommend against consuming that particular product. But if everything else seems up to snuff, then it would be perfectly fine to consume it occasionally with activity, not just as a snack when you're sedentary, obviously. Um, and then protein bars, I don't have a brand off the top of my head that I would really recommend too much. I would say it's funny. And when it comes to protein supplementation products, including powders and bars, I've found as I've taken surveys that people care about the taste and the texture of the product more than they care about anything else. And so I would kind of say that um, you could do your research and kind of find out which of these third-party companies has tested any of the commercially available protein bars um, and see which one seems to be actually having the protein quality that they advertise that they have, and then see if your child even likes it. I mean, a lot of, a lot of these bars do not taste very good. They um, are pretty chalky. Um, and I would say the ones that are legitimate or taste seem to taste worse. Um, and so the ones that you would really want your child to eat, they don't like the way it tastes and they don't like the way it feels in terms of the texture. And that's pretty normal. Um, and this is also true of the protein powders. I will say I've, I've talked about Optimum Nutrition's gold standard protein supplement. If I don't know if they make a protein bar, but if I, if they did, I would say that that's probably okay to consume because that company seems to be time and time tested and they've been around since the sixties. So they've done a good job of staying relevant and, and, and providing a product that people can actually rely on. Um, but I would just say, um, uh, it's probably safe to consume. Again, when we talk about all of these, uh, the supplements that we're talking about, we're talking about protein, uh, protein bars. We're talking about the, the gel chews, all of this is in the context of somebody who's very metabolically active. I don't want anybody who's, who, I don't want the advice to be that someone who's not training quite a bit or exercising regularly. I don't want this to be like some snack that people are using when they're on their off days or something like that. This should be in relative close proximity to activity, practice, training, that sort of thing. And then outside of that, on your recovery days, you should be consuming whole foods that are not terribly processed that are appropriately meeting your nutritional demands between your days of activity. Oh, thank you. Okay. So um, for a soccer tournament or you know, any, any kind of tournament situation where there's two games in the same day, uh, would you recommend a snack um, like in between for the players? And uh, if so, is there like a certain type of snack? Like should they be prioritizing carbs or protein or, you know, what would you recommend? Yeah. So a, a, a carbohydrate and protein mixed snack that's about three to one ratio of three grams of carbohydrates to one gram of protein would probably be ideal with sort of an upper limit. I wouldn't want you to consume much more than about 30 grams of carbohydrates in that, in that time period between games. If you get closer to 60 or more grams of carbohydrates, your insulin spike is going to be pretty high. And that second game is going to feel really bad. You might have abdominal pain. You might feel a little dizzy. You might feel unwell. You won't play as well. So doing too much of a, of a glucose load between the two games may have some detrimental effects. But if you do something, some snack or some meal, small meal that has somewhere between 10 to 20, sorry, 10 to 30 grams of carbohydrates with about five to 10 grams of protein in it would be a good way of providing a little bit of nutrition to, to make sure that you can 
replenish your stores and play well for the um, the next game. And then after that, you can pretty much eat any heavy meal that is appropriate in terms of protein and nutrition and, and um, carbohydrates when you know that you're not going to go right back into another metabolically demanding activity afterwards. And so that would be my general guidelines to what to do between games. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to try to wrap up a few more questions into one. And then um, I think after this, we're going to um, wrap it up and uh, sure. I will share some information in the chat for everyone. If people still have questions, I'm sorry, we didn't get to all of them. Um, well, I'm sharing some information about how you can, you can get more resources, have a one-on-one -on -one discussion um, with Certainly. Dr. Bellagio or someone else who can answer all your specific questions in depth. Uh, so, uh, People have questions about how far in advance um, they should have their their pregame meal, and uh, mm -hmm. any thoughts on like what's what would be like a good thing to serve. People were concerned like you know you don't want to have too many carbohydrates before the game, so how long before? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and also there was a specific question too of like if you have practice before a game, do you have to like factor that into the number of hours before? So kind of you can just speak yeah. about pregame food. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you have practice before a game, you do have to factor that in. Um, it depends on the intensity of the practice. I take it as is commonly uh, uh, in terms of what the common situation that's encountered. The practice right before a game is usually not an intense and, and difficult practice. At least I hope not, because you kind of try to save that energy and that enthusiasm for the game itself. Um, but you do have to factor it in if that's a part of what your child is doing that, that particular day. In terms of what to eat and when to eat it prior to activity, I usually say that if, if you're planning on having a heavy meal, don't do it within three to four hours of an intense activity. So if this is like a like a dish that you're serving that has intense amounts of carbohydrates, where something like rice or pasta is the primary fixture of that meal, um, please don't do it two hours before the game. It's probably not, two hours is probably not enough transit time to fully digest that meal without it slowing the athlete down. And the reason that this happens is twofold. One, as I mentioned already, it causes a spike in insulin that then makes it difficult for your muscles to be able to utilize the glucose they need. And then it makes it difficult for the brain to get the glucose it needs. And then you start to feel dizzy and lightheaded and have a headache. The other thing is that when you consume a heavy meal, blood in your body gets shunted to your intestines because your intestines are very metabolically active to break that meal down and absorb it. When blood goes to the intestines and then soon afterwards in that period, you start working out, your brain is a little bit confused and your body's confused on how am I going to get blood both to my gut and to my muscles at the same time. So one or both of them suffers and you get cramping, you get abdominal pain, you get muscle cramps and those sorts of things. So within, you don't want to do a, a heavy meal um, that's substantially carbohydrate heavy within two hours. I would say three and a half hours would probably be the limit of what, what you should be thinking about. And then if you're close, if you wake up and, it, and so you would, if you as I mentioned during the slides, if you've got an early morning game or a game that's you know, like even like 10 o'clock in the morning, your biggest meal should have been like the night before. You don't want to consume a big meal unless you're waking up at 5 a.m. or something like that. You don't want to consume a big meal soon before your, your game. I would say about two hours before the game, consuming something that has about um, 30 to 60 grams of carbohydrates and 20 grams of protein would be an appropriate option. And that could be a meal that's comprised. I mean, that would own three eggs would get you there something like that would get you to your protein. Um, and then having maybe a piece of toast or, or something else with that would also get you the carbohydrates. So something, some smaller meal like that or any supplement that matches that, that exact parameter I just set a couple of hours before the game would be fine. Once it's in within one hour, you probably don't want to consume anything that's more than, a, than 10 to 15 grams of carbohydrates and five grams of protein. Um, and then immediately before, you don't really want to consume anything other than fluids because that's going to slow you down. It's not going to make you feel as good. So that would be my general guidelines if we're talking four hours, two hours, one hour, just a stepwise approach on how to how to how to get ready for the game. Um, I would say that you're kind of at a disadvantage if you're doing practice before the game. It's it's difficult to consume the appropriate nutrition before practice and then have that carry over to the game. You need enough of a gap between practice and the game to consume a small snack with at least an hour in between so that you can digest that appropriately and utilize that energy before the game. So something that has like 30 grams of carbohydrates and 10 grams of protein, as long as you have an hour between, you could kind of treat it, like I said, as if it's two games, as long as you have about an hour between, that would be fine. If you have less than that, it's probably still okay, but an hour would be sort of ideal between practice and the actual game. 
Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Balaji, for taking the time. Um, and yeah, thank absolutely. you everyone for attending and asking all the great questions. As I said, I'm sorry we couldn't get to them all. Um, but if you have questions or if you want to discuss your personal situation um, with Dr. Balaji or another one of our pediatric sports medicine specialists, um, please call the number that I put in the chat, 844-41-ORTHO, or visit us online at sports.stanfordchildrens.org. Uh, and we also have a sports dietitian available for consults uh, who can pro provide probably even more detailed information about your child's specific case. Um, and I also wanted to say we'll share the recording uh, of the, the presentation soon. And um, thank you, everyone, and I hope you have a great weekend.